Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Dan Pastore, and I'm the chair of the Pennsylvania Fish and Boat Commission's Fishery and Hatcheries Committee. I'd like to call this meeting to order. This meeting is being broadcast on Facebook Live in real time. A recording of the meeting will be available immediately after this meeting on the Commission's Facebook page. A recording will also be posted on the Commission's YouTube page within a few days. Unfortunately, due to the increase in COVID cases, the in-person meeting originally scheduled for last week was moved to this virtual format and rescheduled to today. First, I'd like to welcome John Mann, who has been appointed Commissioner for District 2 and who has taken over for Commissioner Rocco Ally, whose term has expired. We will all miss Commissioner Ally, who is a great advocate for the resource and the people of District 2. Today, we have three discussion items on the agenda, all of which will be presented by Dave Nyhart. First, will be the preliminary results from the 2021 evaluation of 13 Class A stream sections stocked by the Commission with Trout. The second is the results from monitoring select stock trout waters previously designated Class A and removed from the trout stocking program. The third discussion item is Freeman Run Pot Potter County, an overview of the management history electro fishing results and future monitoring plans. We will also have an overview of the fisheries agenda items planned for the January 2022 quarterly committee meeting. Originally, the agenda included a discussion item on habitat enhancement and aquatic organism passage prioritization to be presented by Dave Dunkel. To allow adequate time to address the remaining agenda items, this topic has been removed from the agenda and will be considered at the full commission meeting on January 24th. We have a full presentation today and I ask that the commissioners hold their questions and comments until Mr. Niner completes the presentation of each of the separate topics. And with that, I would turn it over to Mr. Whitaker. Thank you, Commissioner. I will now take roll call. Commissioner Pastore. Present. Commissioner Brock. Present. Commissioner Mon. Present. Commissioner Present. Charlesworth. Here. And Commissioner Gibney. Present. Thank you. Hey, hey Dan, Commissioner Pastore and Chad, if I could just note that um, Rick Kaufman is an ex officio member of each committee as the as the uh, president of the commission. Uh, Commissioner Kaufman, are you present? Yes, I'm present. Thank you. Thank you, Tim. You bet. Thank you, Chad. And um, if Attorney Melnick could please provide the public comment to the commissioners and staff. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Wayne Melnick, Chief Counsel for the Pennsylvania Fish and Boat Commission. In accordance with our practice in, for these virtual meetings, we opened up public comments via a, a call-in number. Uh, those comments were received, recorded, and have been uploaded and shared with the committee member. I will now summarize the seven comments that we did receive. The first was from Mike Pascarella, Westline PA. Mr. Pascarella would like to see a false stocking reinstated in Kinzu Creek, which occurred in the past. Additionally, he states there is not a fall stream stocking in all of McKean County. He believes the resource would warrant a fall stocking, and this would be a good time to introduce kids to fishing, uh, as well as senior citizens. He suggests holding some, some of the fish plan for spring stocking to the fall season. Comment number two is from Garth Magnuson of Kane, Pennsylvania. Uh, Mr. Kane would also like to see the commission perform more fall stocking in McKean County. Um, he suggests the fall stocking on Kinzu Creek, which could free up time for waterways conservation officers in the spring to focus on law enforcement. Comment number three was from Rod Henry 
Ward, Pennsylvania. Uh, Mr. Ward requests restoration of the fall stocking program on his late harvest stretch of Kinzu Creek. He also says that to the best of knowledge, there are no fall stocking programs in McKean or Warren County and requests the commission give consideration here. I, uh, item number four is from Don Patsy, Erie, Pennsylvania. Mr. Patsy, thanks to the commission for all the hard work it performs. He states he's a camp owner in Westline, PA, and also states there is no longer a fall stocking in McKean County. He requests consideration for such a stocking to occur to help kids and introduce them to fishing during a time when the weather is conducive and not many anglers are on the streams. Comment five was from Jonathan Pomeroy, Kane, Pennsylvania. Mr. Kane is part owner of the Westline Inn in Westline, PA. He misses the fall stocking on Kinsey Creek. He requests the commission consider a fall stocking on the creek and believes it will increase the number of people to that area. Comment number six is from Chris Brown, Erie County, Pennsylvania. Mr. Brown also wants the commission to reconsider fall stocking of streams in McKean County. He points out that streams are less crowded in the fall and it's easier to introduce kids to fishing in that season. Finally, uh, comment number seven was from Robert Lacey, Westline, Pennsylvania. Mr. Lacey also supports a fall stocking program in McKean County specifically Somebody. in the special regulations area of Kinsu Creek. So this would be a good time of the year to introduce uh, kids to fly fishing when the crowds are less than the spring season. Uh, Chairman Pastore, that concludes the public comment portion of our agenda. Thank you, Attorney Melnick, and I'll turn it over now to Dave Nyberg for a presentation of the first discussion item. And, and Dave, excuse me if I might, this is uh, Tim Schaefer. So just a reminder, if you're not speaking, to please mute your lines. Thank you. Yes, thank you, uh, Commissioner Pastore. Uh, welcome, welcome staff, commissioners, and, and members of the public. Uh, my name is David Nyard. I'm the chief of the Division of Fisheries Management. And the next four presentations that you'll see, um, I'll, I'll cover. And as Commissioner Pistori mentioned in his opening re open remarks, these, these are likely going to generate a lot of good discussion. And we ask that you hold comments until the end of each presentation. So, so thank you. So the first item on the agenda is the uh, preliminary results from the 2021 evaluation of the 13. Class A stream sections that are also stocked by the commission with hatchery trout. <clears throat> this, this specific, specific issue was identified in our most recent strategic plan for the management of trout fisheries that was implemented and presented to the board back in October of 2020, specifically issue three. There are currently 13 stream sections that support class A wild brown trout population, which are also stocked with trout by the PFBC. These stream sections receive very high yearly season, or very high early season angler use targeted at the stock trout fishery. Updated data describing the biological and social components of, the, of these fisheries are needed to inform the management of these stream sections. Hey, hey, Dave, Dave, hey, Dave if, I apologize for this. So just a reminder, if, if, if one of the commissioners has called in from a, a, a phone, it appears that that's where the feedback's coming from. So reminder, just if you can mute your line, please. Thank you. Sorry, Dave. Uh, it's, it's coming from call in number five. R right, when we're not sure which, which number that is. So just if, if you're a commissioner who's not muted, please mute. Thank you. Yep, thank you, Tim. So specific to that issue three, uh, there's, there's two strategies identified to address that issue. Uh, the first one is by 2022, resurvey the wild brown trout populations and conduct angler use and harvest opinion surveys to inform fisheries management on the 13 class A stream section. This is highlighted red because this is what the presentation is going to cover. Also, uh, between 2022 and 2024, staff will develop options and make recommendations to the commission to adjust current management strategies on these 13 class A stream sections. Um, if the data supports an alternative change or alternative management strategy. 
the 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 bullet point highlighted in or in, in black font is something that uh, will be presented on down the road. But again, today's presentation is just going to cover um, the first bullet point. So here just shows you the location of the 13 stream sections that are currently managed as as stocked as as Class A, but are also stocked by the Commission. You can see here that six of them are located. I'm sorry, uh, five of them are located in in Central PA and center like Cumming Mifflin in, in, in Mifflin County. We have two sections, Yellow Creek, which are located in Bedford County. And the remaining six waters in this program are located out in the lower, uh, the Lehigh Valley area. So at the January 2021 commission meeting, st staff updated uh, criteria that was previously developed indicating what criteria should be considered when continuing stocking a Class A, when an exemption should be um, provided on a stocked water. So I'll cover these real quick and then I'll highlight the one that applies to these 13 stream sections. First, pre-existing youth derbies and special use areas uh, that were properly permitted by the Commission and have a history of more than one past occurrence. The second is pre-existing private stockings on private property on recently designated uh, Class A stream sections. Uh, they went close to the public at Anglin at the time of the Class A designation and at least once since 2010. There needs to be stocking records verifying, verified by the Commission, and there has to be a history of more than one past occurrence. So this one, number three, this is the criteria that was, that was used back in 2015, 16, and 17 when these 13 Class A sections, um, when the decision was made to continue stocking them while they're being designated Class A. So this is stream sections that are stocked by the commission, a cooperative nursery, and or a private group or individual the year prior to the designation. There has to be a history of more than one past occurrence and meet the following sub-criteria. The stream section is stocked with adult trout in the year immediately prior to the designation as Class A. Angler use in the stream section equals or exceeds the 50th percentile during the opening weekend of trout season, or the stream section is a special regulation area under Chapter 65. The trout species stocked is different from the pr primary component of the wild trout population. Stocking numbers and frequency do not exceed those of the year prior to Class A designation, and stream sections managed for wild brook trout will not, will not be eligible for stocking. <clears throat> Excuse me. The last criteria um, is, is number four, previously received an exemption for a special activities permit, or, or commonly referred to as uh, SAPs, from the Commission between 2010 and present. Uh, if a limited time or if, if time limited and expired, it will be considered a new request and evaluated based on the current exemption criteria. So that's the four criteria that staff use to determine if the section should be included in the stock trout program and also be managed as a Class A fishery. And again, the, the third one that was covered was the criteria that was used to determine the, the, the current 13 in the program. So next, a biological assessment was done. This was completed on all 13 stream sections, I think in total, Roughly 27 sites were done in 2021, so a significant amount of, of time and effort was put into sampling these 13 sections. Sampling was conducted using tow barge electrofishing, and here you can see on the slide, the image on the right-hand side is an example of that type of electrofishing method. All historic sampling sites were, were completed. Again, I think there was 27 that were sampled, and population estimates were conducted on all 27 sites. Before I get into what the results were, I just kind of briefly wanted to cover um, a little bit about wild trout population dynamics. And one thing that's important to remember is that these populations are not static. Um, they, they do exhibit natural fluctuations. So you can't go into a, a, a stream section and expect it to maintain, you know, 50 kilograms consistently throughout. There's always fluctuation in these populations, and it's really influenced by a number of factors. Um, habitat, whether it's quality or quantity of, of both the physical and chemical habitat. Also, environmental conditions. You know, what are the flows like? What are the stream temperatures like? Um, what other environmental factors um, can, can be impacting the, the population? All, the next thing is, is human-related um, impacts, and this is a big one, especially when you start looking um, at urbanization, you know, agriculture, land use. Land use is a huge driving force that can impact a, a, a population, and also interaction with other species, whether it's competition or whether it's interaction with predators. So 
On the graph on the right-hand side, this is data that I pulled together. It, it's not specific to a particular stream. It's more or less to be used as an example to show how populations fluctuate from year to year. And you'll see here the orange bar indicates a carrying capacity. So each stream section has a carrying capacity. And that's what determines um, what level of the population, you know, how many, how many individuals of a certain species can a resource um, support. So you can see that there's always a natural fluctuation around that carrying capacity. Sometimes it dips below carrying capacity, but typically it rebounds to above or below, or I mean above or near carrying capacity. So you can see off this 20-year this data that a, a natural population does not remain the same. It, it's not constantly at, at 80 kilograms per hectare year after year. There's always a fluctuation in a population, and it's due to both biotic and abiotic factors that influence that particular stream section. So now we'll look at the uh, populate, population estimates for the 13 Class A waters. So here you can see, uh, as all 13 stream sections listed, the, the blue bars indicate the data that was collected in 2013, with exception to Bald Eagle Creek, this data was collected in 2015. So this is the data that was presented back at the commission meetings that qualified these stream sections for Class A designation. Originally, we were supposed to go and sample these waters uh, in, in 2020, but for obvious reasons with COVID, um, they were, they were pushed back to 2021. So the bars in yellow indicate the most recent data um, from this year, and these stream sections were sampled in the summer of 2021, beginning at the end of June and sampled through, through August, depending on when the historic sampling occurred originally in these stream sections. You can see for the most part, you know, there was a change in population. Some of them increased, some of them decreased, but for the most part, they remained pretty, pretty identical to what they were in 2013 and 2015 with Bald Eagle Creek. One thing I, I do want to point out, and this is just another example of, of how populations fluctuate. So when, when looking at, at some of the initial data that was shown in the previous slide, there, there was one area where you could see a, a decrease in some of the population levels. And this is just providing some additional data, historical data that we had on those particular there's four particular stream sections. And really this shows you that, yes, there was a decrease in 2021 compared to previous years, but there also has, also is a perfect example of how these populations are showing that natural variation in population over time. So yes, it could look concerning, but this is kind of a trend that we've been seeing um, throughout the Lehigh Valley in particular on some of these stream sections that we sampled. Additionally, I wanted to pull together um, data and show you two data on two additional slides. One, Monocacy Creek Section 7. As you can remember from the previous slides, Monocacy Creek Section 8 and Section 9 are two of the 13 stream sections that, um, that, that are also managed for, for Class A and stock trout. And as, <clears throat> excuse me, you saw a decrease in the population from 2015 through 2021. And look at Monocacy Creek Section 7, which is managed under trophy trout artificial lures only regulations, and is not stocked, you can see that that population has declined as well and shows a level of natural variation very similar to the, the two sections downstream of it. I also wanted to include uh, Bushkill Creek, and here you can see this, this stream section is not stocked. It's also managed under special regulations. It's managed under catch and release artificial lures only regulations. And again, you see that natural variation as it's occurring. This stream section is not stocked. Um, at, similar to Section 7 of Baraki Sea Creek. So really the point behind these last two slides is just demonstrating that, yes, some populations have increased, some populations have decreased over the last five or six years, but it really lines up with how other waters um, in the area are reacting. <clears throat> Excuse me. So the next thing I want to talk about is the opening day angler count. So as part of the criteria that was included uh, for allowing these waters um, to be continue to be stocked was, was the angler use percentile um, on opening day, on opening weekend. And it was 50th percentile um, was, was the cutoff, but most of these waters, actually Martins Creek was the only stream section in 2015, 2015 that was at the 50th percentile. The rest of them were above the 75th percentile. So that was the reason we, we determined that these were high use waters and didn't warrant inclusion 
uh, continued inclusion in the stock trout program. So here you can see in the columns highlighted in gray is the qualifying data that was used when these waters were added um, to the Class A program and or Class A designation and the decision was made to continue stocking them. You can see they're all very high use waters, anywhere from the 50th percentile in Martins Creek all the way up to the 95th percentile on some of the waters out in the Lehigh Valley. All these stream sections were uh, opening day angler counts were, were counted this year um, on opening day. And you can see here that by and large, most have remained the same. Um, some of them have decreased slightly, um, but most of them or all of them remain above the 50th percentile with exception to Martins Creek in Northampton County. Again, that was one that was a borderline 50th percentile, but the decrease um, maybe isn't really alarming when you take a look at this. The next slide, all these waters highlighted in yellow are border waters. And why is that important? Because when these opening day angler counts were conducted in the early, in 2011 through 2014, we were under the multiple opening days. So we had two opening days. So these being border counties, we know that individuals that live in these counties tend to go and fish one opening day and the following weekend they'll go and fish the other opening day. So that may explain why there was a slight decrease in the overall use is because now anglers can only have the opportunity to target one opening day, which may explain some of the, the decrease in use. But the other ones outside of those opening day, uh, I'm sorry, outside of the, the, the border waters, border counties have really remained the same with Fishing Creek, Baldua Creek, and Penns Creek. There was a slight dip, but for the most part, they're still exhibiting very high use. The last part was a angler use and harvest and opinion survey was conducted on all 13 class A stream sections. So when staff were out there doing their opening day angler counts, they were also interviewing anglers, trying to get an idea, a better understanding of the use, their harvest, and what the anglers' opinions were. All 13 stream sections were um, surveyed on opening day. There was a subset of stream sections that were sampled during the in season. Uh, we felt comfortable doing this because knowing that we had a, a, a large-scale survey, krill survey, being conducted on Bald Eagle Creek, Section 6, which is one of the, the 13 Class A's. Bald Eagle Creek is, for folks not familiar, it's located in Center County just outside of the, the, the city or the, the borough of Milesburg. So a krill survey was conducted on Bald Eagle Creek from, it started on opening day and ran throughout the summer uh, and ended on Labor Day. So knowing that the data that was collected the, throughout the year on, on Baldwin Creek would really put us in a good position to use that data um, for future management decisions, not only on Baldwin Creek, but for the other 12, other 12 Class A stream sections as well. So we'll get into what some of the questions, and I do wanna point out that the, the next tables that you see are only gonna include the information that was collected on 12 of the Class A stream sections, it's not gonna include the data that was collected as part of the Bald Eagle Creek survey. As I mentioned, a, a large scale survey was, was completed throughout the summer. So we're gonna keep that separated, but there will be a presentation in the future on the information that we learned through this particular survey. So certainly when you look at these responses, they're definitely gonna be skewed towards the opening day angler crowd. Uh, like I mentioned, there's only a subset of these where uh, a handful of, of visits were paid to each of these waters. So again, keep that in mind that when you're seeing this data, it's definitely skewed towards the opening day crowd and, and the folks fishing, fishing uh, opening day weekend. But again, the data that we have on, that we gathered through the Baldy Oak Creek survey is gonna be useful and it's certainly gonna be more representative of, of the use and harvest that's occurring throughout the summer. <clears throat> so the first question, this section of stream is unique in that it supports the Class A wild brown trout population and is also stocked with rainbow trout by the commission each spring. It is managed under statewide angling regulations, um, which include seven inch minimum size limit, five fish per day creel from the opening day through Labor Day. How would you rate the commission's current approach in managing the trout fishery in this section? And you can see here, overwhelming majority of the folks indicated that, that the quality of fishery was either excellent, very good, or good. Um, which isn't surprising because, you know, folks that are going there, there's, you know, the fish have been, uh, folks targeting the rainbow trout have, you know, the fish have been recently stocked. So, you know, it's no surprise that they were enjoying the time there 
and we're in favor of the current management strategy. The next question, uh, do you fish this section of stream primary to catch stock rainbow trout, wild brown trout, or both? Again, you can see that a majority of the folks indicated that they were there to catch both, uh, which is very typical of folks fishing in on opening day and opening day weekend. You know, they're there to catch fish. They're not really uh, too worried about whether they're catching a brown trout or rainbow trout. They just want to catch fish. But you can see uh, the folks that indicated they were targeting one specific species, stock rainbow trout, uh, about twice as many people indicated they were there to catch them compared to wild brown trout. So how would you rate the quality of the stock trout fishery in the stream section? Again, no surprise. Most folks indicated that, that they, were, they were satisfied anywhere from good to an excellent on the quality of the, the stock trout fishery. Opening day weekend, again, you know, as an agency, we're doing everything we can to provide the best experience for anglers on opening day by stocking these waters during the ideal time. So it's no surprise that, that overall folks were satisfied with their, um, the quality of the stock trout streams, quality of the stock trout fishery in this stream sections. How do you rate the quality of the wild trout fishery in this stream section? Um, you can see here, again, overall, people were happy with the, with the quality of the wild trout fishery. Really no surprise here um, when, you, when, you, when you look at this as well. One of the next questions was asked was, how many trips do you make to this section each year? So looking at this, a majority of the folks um, make very few trips. About 15% of everybody interviewed is only going to make one trip. You know, a lot of people fish uh, by, a, by a trout license or a, a trout permit to fish for opening day. And so that's not really surprising to see that, you know, that's the only trip that some of these folks will be doing to the stream is on opening day. Again, the next followed by two to five angler trips per year. Likely the, the opening day crowd and the individuals that are fishing for stock trout within the first few weeks of the year. When you start getting into anglers indicating that they, they're fishing, you know, more than 10, 20 times a year, these are the folks that are likely utilizing these stream sections throughout the year that may be fishing for stock trout early in the season, but as the stock trout um, resource tends to diminish throughout the year, you know, these folks are traveling to these waters um, in, in favor of fishing for, for, for wild fish. So the next question, how, how often do you harvest legal size trout when fishing in a stream section? So um, looking at this, you know, 63% of the people indicated that, you know, rarely to almost always uh, they, they harvest fish. And, and these numbers can certainly jump out, you, jump out at you and may be alarming. But again, this is really skewed again towards the opening day angler crowd when folks are really more harvest oriented. Um, than, than individuals fishing, you know, following the first few weeks of, of, of uh, opening, first few weeks following opening day. So there definitely is harvest going on, but as the results in, in Body Oak Creek, when we have time to um, present that, that you'll see that that harvest does occur throughout the year, but it is heavily, uh, more harvest is occurring during opening day and, and the subsequent weeks after that. So a follow-up question to that is, do you usually harvest wild brown trout or stock trout? The majority of, of the folks either indicated that they'll harvest both, or you can see here that if they're, they're identifying one species, most folks that are harvesting fish are there to harvest the stock trout uh, component of the fishery. The last question is, what type of terminal tackle do you fish with? Um, in looking at this, the majority of the, the anglers interviewed were there fishing with bait or a combination of, combination of bait. This is certainly true um, during the opening day and the weeks following opening day, but as time goes on, as, as the year progresses, you know, more and more the component of the fishery is going to be, more and more the angler component of the fishery is going to be made up of folks fishing with, with lures and flies. So this is only a, a handful of the questions that were asked. Certainly, I think in total there were 19 questions that were asked during the interview process. The other questions really get into anglers' opinions on future management of the stream section. And that information will be included in a future presentation as we start to kind of develop our strategies, how we want to move forward with managing these streams. That's when that information is going to be included. So this is only a subset of the questions that were asked during the, the CREAL survey. So what are the next steps? 
staff will continue to review the biological and social data for all 13 stream sections. As I mentioned before, uh, section six of Baldy Oak Creek, um, the krill survey ran throughout the summer. Staff are currently in the process of, of reviewing the data and pulling together a draft report. So that information that is learned through, through that survey is gonna be critical to um, future management of, of the remaining 12 sections as well. We'll present all of our findings at a future commission meeting and staff will make recommendations to the commission to adjust the current management if the data supports alternative uh, management strategies really to optimize the fisheries present in these stream sections. So that is the end of that presentation. Um, we do have time, or this is appropriate time for questions. Thank you, David. Does anyone have any questions? Yes, I do, Dan. This is Commissioner Gibney. Dave, earlier in the presentation, you you listed uh, a carrying capacity line for, for the surveys. How is carrying capacity determined for any particular stream? Yeah, that's a good question. And certainly the carrying capacity for one stream isn't necessarily gonna be um, the same for another. When you look at carrying capacity, it's, it's the number of individuals that a, a population of a certain species, you know, what level can that resource support of that certain species? And there's many different things that go in and, and really determine what the carrying capacity be. You know, mostly when you, you look at it, you look at it from, you know, what are the abiotic factors that can influence a population? And you start looking at physical habitat. You start looking at chemical habitat. And then you look at the biotic factors, you know, what, what other, you know, the predators, the prey, the, all the other, that type of um, interactions with, with living organisms, that is really what determines a stream's carrying capacity. So if you have a stream that has very poor habitat, you know, there's a good likelihood that your that your carrying capacity is going to be different if you had the same stream with the similar characteristics but had better habitat. So it's certainly it's certainly a case by case basis or stream by stream basis. Is it reasonable to presume that the carrying capacity is most likely representative of the population of a particular species at the end of winter or late March? I, I, I guess I'm not following your question, Commissioner. I'm sorry. So it would seem to me that um, the least amount of available food it would be in that time of the year. So that would be the most stressful uh, portion of the year for any given species. So that, you Certainly, know. A, stream, a, a stream's carrying capacity can fluctuate throughout the year because throughout the year, you know, there's additional stressors, whether, you know, it, it's a change in habitat, you know, colder weather, you know, whether there's other influences, spawning stress, habitat limitability, um, you know, food limit, limited, uh, food availability, you know, all those vary throughout the year. So certainly, you know, at any one given point in the, a particular year, a stream section's carrying capacity could fluctuate. Okay, thank you. Uh, David, this is Commissioner Pastore. I think on page 11, you showed uh, biomass results. And my question is, do you also look at the size distribution? I mean, seems to me you could have fewer fish that are larger, more fish that are smaller, so the composition could change considerably and you'd still wind up with the same biomass. So I'm just wondering if you take that into account also. Yeah, so for this, we, we, use, we use the biomass just because um, that's the one thing that really resonates with individuals and that's the criteria that, that's used to um, determine if a stream section meets class A criteria or not. But yes, we do have the data that looks at the size structure um, in comparison to what was collected in 2013, 15 into 2021. But yes, certainly there's fluctuation even within a population structure. You know, any given year you could have more, you know, juvenile fish than the previous year and vice versa with adult fish as well. So we do have that data. And again, that's the kind of stuff that could be presented, um, you know, when we're at a future meeting, whenever we're, we're we're determining staff are determining, you know, what direction do we need to take these waters? 
or what direction do we need to, to look at managing these waters? Thank you. Does anyone Thank else? You. Questions? If not, then Dave, if you want to move on to the next item. Then. Yes, thank you, Commissioner Pistori. <clears throat> so the second presentation is going to cover um, results for monitoring select from select stock trout waters that were previously designated Class A and removed from the stock trout program in favor of wild trout management. So there's two really things we're looking at here. Um, how have wild trout populations responded to stocking cessation? Um, two questions. Do wild trout populations maintain high biomass levels? You know, one thing we commonly hear is that once the water is removed from the stock trout program, that a recreational fishery it is no longer there. So do they continue to provide a fishery for, for, for anglers? So those are two things that um, we often get asked following a water being removed from the stock trout program in favor of wild trout management. So with this, I'll just provide a couple of examples that, that we have. So this is an example of four waters, four stream sections that were removed from the stock trout program in, in 2022 uh, in, favor of manage, in favor of wild trout management. You can see here, uh, three of them are located in, in Clinton County, the being Long Run, Rocktown Creek, and Green Lick Run, and then a, a fourth one located in Bedford County, which is Three Springs Run. So these, these stream sections were sampled back uh, prior to them being removed from the stock trout program and then additional sampling was done following them being removed from the stock trout program. So you can see on the graph here in the black uh, vertical bar in the middle is, is delineating when they were removed from the stock trout program. So all four of these stream sections were managed as stock trout fisheries in 2010 and 2011. Following the sampling in 2011, they, they were removed from the stock trout program and all designated class A um, at the end of 2011. So looking at the data, you can see that, that these populations uh, were at or, or near Class A um, biomass criteria while they were being stocked. Following 2011 and being removed from the program for the stock trout program in 2012, you can see that in most cases the population, the wild, the wild trout biomass uh, increased and maintained, um, especially in Green Lake Run, you can see that the population um, almost doubled the year following being removed from the stock trout program. So, how did how did these you know once they were removed to once they were removed from the program, being two years removed in 2013, you can see that the populations uh, maintained and improved from 2010 and 11. So. The quality of the wild trout fishery uh, was not diminished. It, it still met Class A criteria, and you know our Class A waters. Really, the goal of that one of the goals of that whole program is these are our wild trout waters that do provide high quality year-round fishing. So they maintained um, that that high quality recreational uh, value as well. We do have additional data on, on two of these streams, um, Rocktown and, and Long Run, and I'm sorry, and even Green Run, Green Lake Run that were done in 2018 and 19, and the populations have maintained this level and actually have, all of them have increased. So even going on um, 10 years removed from the stock trout program, these waters all are still maintaining a Class A biomass and all still providing a recreational opportunities for anglers. The next example um, I wanted to include is the East Fork Semihoning Creek, which Section 3 is in Potter County. Uh, this would be outside of the Wharton area for, for folks who are familiar with, with this part of Potter County. This water was included in our stock trout waters program through 1982. Uh, we, we, the, the history that you guys have, have seen with our Class A program know that following Operation Future, the Class A um, waters program was, was really developed in 1983. And this is one, this is one of the first waters that we added um, to the Class A program and removed from the stock trout program in favor of wild trout management. So um, nearly 40 years ago, you know, the decision was made that, you know, we're gonna remove certain waters from the program in favor of, of wild trout management. And this is just one of them. 
So here you can see the, the data that was collected in 1980 uh, was right around 40 kilograms per hectare. And then following um, Section 3 being removed from the program, the population increased and it has maintained its biomass levels through our last survey in 2006. I, I do want to point out, yes, 2006 is 15 years ago, um, but as, as most of you probably remember, Section 2 and Section 4 of the East Fork of Cinnamon Hounding Creek were sampled in 2018, and both of those waters, or both of those sections of the East Fork were added to the Class A program, just demonstrating that in a whole, this, this stream sections now one through four are continuing to maintain healthy Class A populations uh, in this stream section. The last one I'll, I'll cover, and I'm sure most of you are probably tired of hearing about Penn's Creek Section 3, but this, this is a perfect example, and, and you'll see why just the, the time series that we have for this section really just demonstrates uh, um, what we're talking about here, about providing, um, continuous, continuing to provide opportunities and that the population has remained stable. So briefly, um, Section 3 was included in the stock trout program through 1994. It was removed from the program and managed under special regulations and designated Class A in 1995. And this truly is a destination fishery. So this fishery has seen increased levels of angler participation when you look at some of the, especially when you look at the other five examples that we're giving. So looking at the data, uh, you can see here again the black bar indicating when stocking was terminated. So in 1995, following uh, the cessation of stocking, Penn's Creek Section 3 maintained a Class A biomass. And this is a perfect example. If you go back and look at the data that was presented uh, earlier in, in the previous presentation that talked about the fluctuation of populations, this is a perfect example using data that we have that shows you the variation um, from one year to another in a, in a wild trout population. And this, this Penn's Creek, as I mentioned before, is a destination fishery and it does receive a substantial amount of angler pressure. And even with that pressure, this population that is managed for wild trout and is not supported in any way by stock trout still provides opportunities to go and fish over a high quality fishery. So uh, just another example um, that we have. So to kind of get back and answer the questions that were originally included on the first slide is, is, is wild trout biomasses did improve following the termination of stocking. And, and one thing that, two things really that are worth pointing out is that these stream sections supported moderate to high biomass levels while they're being stocked. Uh, also, and, and a really important one to, to remember is that all these stream sections had excellent uh, chemical and physical habitat. So, if, if they didn't, um, we wouldn't have likely seen an increase in, in the wild trout biomass. And, and it really goes back to that um, you have to determine if, if, if the quality of the wild trout fishery is, is being impacted by stock trout, um, whether it's, it's through you know, increased angler pressure, the um, chances of, of these fish being harvested, you know, if that's playing a role in, in limiting the wild trout population, then yes, you'll see a bump. But if you remove a water from the stock trout program and it lacks the other key characteristics that are required for a quality wild trout fishery, you're not going to see an increase in that biomass. So you have to have all, all, all the key um, characteristics there that, that do include uh, the chemical and physical habitat as well. And as previously demonstrated, yes, they continue to provide a high quality recreational fishery. And one thing that's great about these is, is they provide year round opportunities for anglers to fish. Waters managed under stock trout do, are closed following the extended season um, for the period from the extended season to opening day. So you are limiting when those fisheries can be utilized, whereas something managed as stock trout, or I'm sorry, as a wild trout fishery is open on a year round basis. Commissioner Pistori, that's the end of that, present, that presentation. So, commissioners, if I might, this is Tim Schaefer. We just wanted to do a, an audio check here uh, for Mike since we had some feedback at the beginning. I'm just going to go around um, and just call you by name. If you could just say um, that, that you can uh, hear, please respond so when I, when I ask. So, Dan Pastori, uh, is your mic working? Yes, thank you. Great. John Mon. 
Yes, Tim, thank you. Great, Bill Brock. Uh, yes, Tim. Donnie Anderson. Yes. Eric Hussar. Yes. BJ Small. Good. Yes, Tim. Richard Lewis. Yes. Charlie Charlesworth. Yes. Bill Gibney. Yes. Great. Rick Kaufman. Yes. Great. And if something would happen where we would need to mute your line, a reminder that star six will unmute you. So turn it back over to Dan. Thank you, Tim. I, I understand Commissioner Hussar had a comment on the earlier presentation, but uh, was having some trouble with the audio. Um, Commissioner Hussar, do you do you want to comment now or not? Uh, no, Dan, thanks. I'll uh, I'll circle back to that um, after the presentation. As long as you can hear me, I'm, I'm good for now. Okay, thank you. Does anyone else have any questions on this topic? Um, if not, then uh, Mr. Nyhart, if you want to move on to the next topic, please. Yep, absolutely. Thank you, Commissioner Pistori. Um, so the third of four presentations um, today is going to cover Freeman Run, which is located in Potter County. And we'll give an overview of the management history, some of the electric fishing, re fishing results, and we'll follow it up by the future modern management plans uh, for Freeman Run. So to give you a little bit of background, Freeman Run is located in Potter County, and you can see here on the map where the red star. So it's located in the southwestern part of Potter County outside of a couple of the, the more popular areas up there being Austin and, and Wharton area. It's 12.23 miles in length. It's a tributary to the first fork of the Cinnamonian Creek. And currently for fisheries management purposes, the agency manage, is managing this stream as under S4 sections. So section one is 2.83 miles in length. Uh, and it runs from the headwaters downstream to Postal Weight Hollow. So you can see that this is the upper end uh, of the stream section um, depicted here in, in the map and the inset on the right. Historically, this stream section was, has been managed for wild trout with no stocking. It hasn't been stocked by our agency or a cooperative nursery. Uh, the current management strategy, this section, section one, as well as sections two, three, and four, we're all sampled by staff in 2018 to get some updated information uh, and really track the status of the wild trout populations uh, within the watershed. So in 2019, the stream section was designated as, as Class A and it is, and is still managed for wild trout with no stocking. So in the, as I indicated, the, the rationale for, for the change in management strategy is just because of the Class A biomass that was, that was determined following the surveys that were um, done in August of 2018. The wild, brow, the, the wild trout biomass um, for this particular stream section was 44.68 kilograms per hectare, again, above the threshold that is required for, in this case, a, a class A brook trout fishery. So here's the data, and you can see that one sample site was done um, on section one. The catch data um, is provided here, and this is the same data that would have been provided uh, back in 2019 when this water was, was added to the Class A program, and it would have been presented at the commission meeting at that time as well. So you can see here the upper end of Freeman Run is a brook trout fishery. Uh, no brown trout were collected, and you can see it had, it, when you look at expected size distribution of a, of a small headwater stream, this is pretty typical of what you would expect your young of the year fish ranging from three inches up to your adults, uh, topping out at nine inches. So this is the electric fishing results that we had for section one. <clears throat> section two uh, is roughly two miles in length. It runs from Postal Weight Hollow downstream to Bark Shanty Hollow Run. Uh, historically, it was managed for, uh, very similar to section one, it's been managed for wild trout with no stocking. Its current management strategy identical to what was I discussed for um, section three of the East Fork. This is one of the first waters that we put into the Class A program in 1983. And section two has been managed as a Class A water with no stocking since 1983. 
Um, the data that was collected in 1980 that, that was used to um, determine an, its eligibility for a Class A designation, at the time there was 55.53 kilograms of, of trout collected. As I mentioned before, this stream section was also sampled in 2018, and the data that was collected in 2018, the stream section still supports a Class A population. Here's the data that um, from the one sample site, sample site from Freeman Run. You can see once you start getting down into this part, it, it starts transitioning into more of a brown trout fishery, but there are brook trout present, and obviously with, with um, you know, these two sections being adjacent to each other, Obviously, these fish are utilizing the habitat in both stream sections. But again, predominantly, this stream section is made up of, of wild brown trout anywhere from 2 to 18 inches in length. And there were brook trout collected as well. So you can see here that young of the year and adults were also collected uh, for brook trout. Section 3 is about 4.5 miles in length and flows from Bark Shanty Hollow downstream to the West Branch to the confluence of the West Branch of Freeman Run. Historically, this stream section was managed as a stock trout water. It was stocked by the commission and a cooperative nursery, uh, both during the pre and in season stocking periods. In, two th er, <clears throat> excuse me. in 2020, uh, the stream section was designated as Class A at the October commission meeting and staff recommended it that the stream section be managed for wild trout with no stocking. The reasoning behind that was the Class A biomass that was documented following the 2018 surveys. And you can see here that it had a biomass of roughly 56 kilograms per hectare, again, above the, above the, um, the criteria of, of 40 kilograms per hectare that allows the water to be included or be designated as Class A. Here's the electrofishing results. Um, given the length of Section 3, two sample sites um, were, were sampled in Section 3, and this really allows us to ensure that we're hitting all the habitat, all the key habitat that's present in this section and make sure that we're actually getting a representative um, sample or getting a sample that, that truly represents the entire section. So two sections were, two sample sites were done in section three. Similar to section two, this, this is predominantly made up of brown trout, but again, there are brook trout present um, in section three and, and undoubtedly these, these species are moving throughout Freeman Run and its tributaries throughout the year. Kind of similar to the size structure that we saw in section two, um, young of the year brown trout from two to three inches up to adults that, that, that um, we collected up to 15 inches in size. Section four, um, so the, the bottom section of, of Freeman Run runs from the confluence of the west branch of Freeman Run just outside the town of Austin, downstream to its confluence with the first fork. Um, historically, this stream section, very, very similar to Section 3, was managed as a stock trout water. Also, like Section 3, it was stocked on the pre- and in-season basis by the Commission and a cooperative nursery as well. The current management strategy for Section 4 is this water, uh, this stream section, was designated Class A at the October 2020 Commission meeting, and staff recommended that this stream section be managed for wild trout with no stocking. Again, the Class A, the data uh, collected in 2028 documented a Class A wild trout population. That biomass was just over 66 kilograms per hectare. And here, very similar to section, section two and three, you can see um, the, 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 the catch data. We had brown trout ranging anywhere from two to 18 inches, but brook trout, again, were also collected in this stream section and are clearly a, a component of the fishery in Freeman Run. <clears throat> Excuse me. So the last part I want to talk about is some of the future monitoring and management strategies uh, on Freeman Run. But I just want to give give you guys an idea um, of not only Freeman Run but the Freeman Run watershed. So looking at this map, and I apologize if if it's hard to see and some of the line colors are hard to to make out. Um, but Freeman Run, there's 74 miles of flowing water in Freeman Run. So this accounts for Freeman Run itself and all of its tributaries. So of those 74 miles, 41 miles have been sampled by staff, and we've documented wild trout in 41 of the 74 miles. So nearly two-thirds of all the flowing water in this watershed staff have documented wild trout in. 
one thing that's important to remember, and, and I'm sure you, know, you guys have heard this before uh, in other presentations, that yes, we've documented wild trout in 41 of the 74 miles, but the remaining 33 miles that we haven't sampled or, or haven't documented wild trout in are also classified as wild trout streams based off of being tributaries to wild trout, wild trout streams and the function uh, that these tributaries have for their importance of, of habitat. Um, you know, whether it's nurseries, refuge areas, or just the cold water that they provide. So all 74 miles in this watershed are designated as wild trout. And even more surprising, or, or at least, and I shouldn't say surprising, but even on, on a, a better note is 24 of those 74 miles, staff have documented Class A population. So nearly a third of all the flowing water in Freeman One watershed supports a Class A population. So that's pretty astounding. So staff recommend that um, as far as future monitoring and, 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 and management strategies, really we, we want to continue to manage Freeman Run, uh, not only Freeman, Freeman Run itself, but Freeman Run and all of its tributaries for wild trout, uh, and specifically solely for wild trout. We'll continue to monitor wild trout populations to track the status and trends within the watershed. Uh, and just a couple of things to put on everybody's radar, that this year in 2022, staff will be going back and resampling sections three and sections four of Freeman Run. Um, we'll go back and we'll, we'll duplicate the efforts that were, that were done in 2018 on the historic sections. So I'd encourage anybody that's listening that's from that area has a vested interest in Freeman Run, um, certainly it would be worth your time and well worth your time to see this sampling in action. Also looking at things on a watershed level, I continue to look at things on a watershed level. Um, as Commissioner Pastore mentioned during his opening remarks, there was a pre presentation that was removed from this, but will be presented during the January commission meeting by Dave DePold. And he was gonna get into a lot of the work and really look at the substantial amount of, of time and effort that's being invested in Freeman Run to address some of the limiting factors, whether it, it's in-stream habitat or some of the barriers that, that may act as a, um, a passage issue within this watershed. So um, not only will we be doing sampling in Freeman Run and its tributaries, but there's gonna be a lot of, and there is, and there will continue to be a lot of good habitat work um, to address some of the issues that this watershed has. And with that, Commissioner Pistori is, is the end of the presentation. Thank you, Mr. Neihardt. Does anyone have any questions or discussion on this? Dan, yeah, Dan, this is Eric Hussar. Thanks, thank you. Um, Dave, first of all, that last statistic, you just, you know, the data on that 74 mile watershed is, like you said, that's extraordinary with the wild trout population in there. Um, getting back to your, you know, one of the prior screens, uh, we were talking about pairing capacity and such. I mean, the, the fact of the matter is, I and mean, you could, I don't know, you could, you know, add to this that these trout move too within the stream sections. I mean, they, it's 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 like a restaurant. They sit where the food is. If the food's not there, they move. If the you know predation or pressure on them, they move. If there's water temperature issues and thermal issues, they move. So that does happen within all these wild trout stream sections correct as as you know in, 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 you know as you were talking about carrying capacity i mean the reality of it is these fish are moving too is that a fair statement or it's they're not yeah, yeah. i mean they're yeah. not just and, sit in one section and and i mean that's part of the wild trout life cycle they are going to move where the food is if there's no food on at this spot, they are going to move to where the food is. Yeah, certainly the wild trout will, will move throughout a, a not only a stream but a watershed level. Um, you know whether they're looking for you know suitable spawning habitat. You know uh, whatever the case may be, and that that just goes to further show the importance of protecting um, tributaries to class A's and tributaries to wild trout because at some level, at some um, at point in time, the wild trout that are not only in that stream section, but the watershed are utilizing really all the flowing water within the watershed. 
Okay. Yep. Thank thank you for that. And and, and again on uh, that last uh, the, the impact on um, um, the habitat in that watershed and, and the ability for that to sustain these uh, um, these self sustaining fish populations is uh, it's like you said pretty extraordinary. Thank you. Uh, David, this is Commissioner Pastore. So, am I you, in sections three and four? You showed the biomass, and there was a, a predominantly brown trout. Um, am I correct? I'm trying to pull up the criteria for Class A designation that neither of those sections would qualify as a Class A brook trout fishery, nor would they qualify as a mixed brook and brown, brown trout fishery. They would, they're only getting classified based on the brown trout fishery. Is that correct? That is correct. That the data that was collected and the criteria that is outlined for a, a stream section to be designated as class A varies by species. Um, so when it comes to how it's going to be, it, a class A designation is a class A designation. Um, you know, whether it's it's managed, whether it has brook trout, brown trout, rainbow trout, a combination, but what comes in is the thresholds of what biomass needs to be present. So when we have a stream section that has a, a sympatric population of brook and brown trout, there's a 75% threshold in biomass that has to be met. Not, not one species can make up more than 75% of that biomass to have it be, it's not Class A waters aren't designated as a Class A brown trout fishery, as a Class A brook trout fishery. That's the fishery that's present within a Class A stream section. They're designated and voted by you, you guys on the board, as Class A. Um, the species doesn't play a part in, in, in um, you know, the designation outside of the, the biomass criteria. So, yes, those stream sections, a, a large component of the fishery in Sections 3 and Section 4, isn't made up of, of, of brook trout, but one thing is, and it goes back to even what Commissioner Hassar was saying, is that there are brook trout present in that system, and specifically the tributaries to sections three and four, there are class A tributaries that dump in, or even just wild trout tributaries in general, that all harbor healthy populations of brook trout. So just because brook trout aren't present in there when sampling is done is July, doesn't mean that those fish aren't gonna be, be found in there during other times of the year. You know, they may be dropping down in there in the spall, in the, in the springtime to spawn. They may be utilizing other habitat characteristics that's more suitable in sections three during certain times of the year. So yes, by, by um, when we list Freeman Run sections three and four on our website for anglers, they're listed as brown trout fishery because that's the criteria that was used um, when they were designated as class A, but it doesn't mean that brook trout do not play a part of that fishery. Okay, thank you. I guess so, where I was going with this is um, uh, back on slide seven, we talked about it, the criteria for granting an exemption. And one of the criteria is whether the stream sections managed for wild brook trout. And so I was just trying to understand what that meant, whether these two stream sections are being considered as being managed for wild brook trout when they, they don't meet the criteria for designation as either a mixed brook and brown or as a wild brown trout class A fishery. So that's what I'm trying to understand. How does yeah, the- so, Yeah, so certainly whenever we have um, you know, other examples is, is a class A is a designation that's applied to some wild trout water. Certainly we have more waters that are designated wild trout that are not also designated class A that, that have brook trout populations. So even, those, even though a water doesn't have the class A designation to it, they're still managed for whatever fishery is in there. So if we have a wild trout fishery that has a biomass of 10 kilograms per hectare, that fishery is still being managed for brook trout, even though it doesn't have a class A biomass associated with it. If that well, makes just, sense. Just, and, and so I understand this. just, I mean, you could it, essentially it, find two brook trout in the sample and, and we're gonna treat that as managed for brook trout 
even if those are the only two fish you find in the entire sample. And, and it, it goes back to, you know, the watershed look at this too, is only, even though only a handful of brook trout were present in that stream section at that time, when you take a step back and look at Freeman Run's watershed in, in its entirety, you will notice a significant amount of wild brook trout resources that are dumping in directly into Freeman Run or dumping into tributaries to Freeman Run. And there's no doubt that those fish and those tributaries are utilizing um, Freeman Run as well. And I, I know Chris was trying to jump in, so I apologize, Chris, I, I think. No, 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 that's fine, Dave. I, I just, it's, it's difficult in the virtual environment sometimes to, to raise your hand. And I just, I just wanted to expand upon just a little bit on, on, on what Dave had mentioned. So, and certainly um, the, the criteria that are developed for uh, consideration of continued stocking of a Class A um, do not require, um, say, a Class A brook trout designation to be considered for uh, managed for brook trout. We we put brook trout first in our management strategies in everything that we do in wild trout in Pennsylvania, given given the native aspect of that fish species. And certainly, as as Eric and and, and Dave had expanded upon as well, that what we see is we we see movement around the watershed. Um, all the time with fish when there's free passage and fish will move throughout a watershed to complete different life history needs, whether it be reproduction, feeding, uh, refugia for cold water, deep water. And so a lot of our surveys are conducted uh, during the summer months and, and that, that, is, that is a period in time where, you know, fish movement may be minimal. And, and so where we, where we would expect that uh, brook trout might move down into these lower reaches would be during winter when water temperatures increase or uh, decrease rather as brook trout are more suited to those, those lower water temperatures. So my, my point is that, is it just, I understand where you're coming from, Commissioner Pastore, in that, 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 that there's a small number of fish, brook trout, in the survey. We would still consider them a component of the trout com community and want to do what we could to, to, to maximize or optimize their population levels. So we put those first. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Dave, great presentation. I mean, it is a. Uh, this is Commissioner Brock. It is a. It is a. A, a, a beautiful stream. A um, couple questions. The um, couple questions. A couple comments. Do you? You know, obviously, it, it's a pretty strong brown trout fishery down below. Um, yet they had stocked over top of that for for decades. Um, so, in, in your opinion, you know, how does that how does that play into it? I mean, I'm trying to figure out how we have such a strong. Well, it's a, it's kind of an observation. We have a very strong brown trout, wild brown trout population down below. Um, yet, I think I think those sections three and four were, were were heavily stocked. I don't know how far back it goes, but I'm guessing decades. Um, could you just comment on that? As to as to you know, are those those stocked fish obviously aren't having a huge impact on the brown trout. Um, I just, your opinion on that or, or some explanation. Yes, yeah, so certainly when you look at, at Freeman Run, um, as mentioned, you know, as you get into the headwaters, it's, it's dominated by brook trout. And as you start moving down the length of, of Freeman Run, you start to become more of a transition between a mix of brook and brown. And really you have to look at, you know, what's the land use and what's the physical characteristics of Freeman Run in itself. So obviously there's, as you move down through a system, you know, warmer water temperature tends to pick up. Um, you know, you may have a change in land use. You may have a change in overall habitat that may be preferred by brown trout. So, you know, the reason you see that in Freeman Run, you know, in, in waters of, of similar size and of, of land use characteristics, you're going to see the same trend. Um, it, it's not that, you know, that brown trout aren't found down there. I mean, as Chris mentioned before, you know, they, they are found there and they're certainly found there at, at higher concentrations depending on the time of the year. But when our surveys were done, 
you know, in the summertime is when you would expect that if, you know, most of those brook trout being less tolerant to, to water temperatures that are probably finding somewhere else to, to spend their day. And, and that's why they're not being documented at a high level as what you would see up in section one that is heavily forested is, is, is very minimally impact um, by, by water temperature changes by, by land use. Well, the, but, but what about the, the fact that we stopped it for, for years? Um, it doesn't seem to have had, um, that if there was a negative impact, it doesn't seem like it, 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 it was significant. Well, I, I think it, at this point, I wouldn't be comfortable saying whether or not there was a negative impact from the stocking. We haven't gone back uh, and, and sampled any additional um, more in Section 3 and 4, which we plan to do this year. I mean, as the present, I guess, the presentation before or two before that, when you're looking at, um, and, and the reason I threw in the Rock Towns, the Long Runs, the East Branch, uh, is because there, there are streams of similar, similar size and characteristics as you see in Freeman Run. So following the determination of stocking, those wild trout populations actually improved. And I, I, would, I would say it's, I wouldn't be surprised that following the stocking, if you went back down and when you sampled sections three and four, if more brook trout weren't present. So I, I don't think it's, it's a, it's a um, good, good assessment to say, or, or good to say that, yeah, they didn't have any impact. Uh, we don't have the data on that on, on Freeman Run itself, but we do have similar data from, from waters that have, have similar characteristics that show that these wild trout populations um, do rebound or will fair, improve. Fair enough. That, that, that's a good explanation, and, and, and I, I buy into it. I guess, you know, what I'm, the issue of Freeman Run is that, it, it, you know, when it, when it was approved, it was, um, there, there, there wasn't a lot of pushback, per se. There might have been some, but I, I think what I'm struggling with is, that, you know, as we look at these streams and we look at these designations, and, and, I, and I think I've said it before and I'll say it again, I, I am, I am 100% on the macro level behind our Class A program. I think it's, it's incredibly important to the state. I think it's important to the future. My, my, the challenge is always it's a long game. And, you know, when you look just at Freeman Run and you don't zoom that map out, um, we've done a lot of designations in Potter County. And, and, you know, obviously there's a lot of wild trout and a lot of Class A streams, but they're, they're, they may be in other locations as well. But the concentration of, of Class A, issue, my, issue, my issue with with Freeman is not Freeman itself. I mean, I, 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 fished, I fished it as a kid, um, as an adult, but the, the issue came up with Freeman Run with, with some of the new additional designations that are being proposed within that area. Um, and, and really with the reality that it, it Freeman does flow through a community, which is kind of a, a, a different issue. Um, but when I look at our co-op over there, there, there's two of them. We kind of, this kind of happened up on the East Fork um, and thankfully, we were able to get it uh, above the campground when we when we when it was designated, even though the whole stream was Class A. But we we had to make some accommodations. I mean, my concern is that maybe Freeman would have would have would have held its own, and there you know you wouldn't be hearing from me on this if we had waited a couple of years and did all the things you're talking about doing and really be able to demonstrate the value of the class A, but my concern is, is that locally, uh, there just hasn't been a lot of support. And I think it's because we're, we're moving so fast and, and we're, we're designating a lot of class A streams in, a, in, a, in somewhat of a concentrated area. And yet there's, you know, there's 2,400 unassessed streams out there. Um, and, and I think this program needs time and we need time um, to be able to sell it to the, to the communities. Um, you know, the other concerns that the, you know, the, the co-ops, with the, and this is not directly related, um, but it is related with the additional designations. I mean, the Genesee, I mean, as, as it turns out, um, the, the co-op wouldn't have been able to stock in there after this year anyways, but that was probably more an oversight on our part than anything else. But, you know, our co-ops are our partners. They've been, we've asked them to be partners, their stewardship. And, and, and the reality is in the Freeman Run area, in the Austin area, they're just running out of streams. And I think that if 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 we had more time with the ones we designated and we dispersed them and we could really build the case, um, I, I think we'd be in a better position. But I mean, one of the things on my agenda today is that 
is I, I've asked Dan to put a motion on the table for consideration um, to resume the stocking. And I, and I think it's because we haven't, we, we've kind of concentrated on a single area. Um, and if they're class A, they're class A, but we do stock over class A fish. We do it on pens, we do it on some other streams. Um, but I, I think there's concerns in the community regarding, you know, the, the local economy for one, the socioeconomics. I mean, Austin PA has um, hunting and fishing season. That's really what they depend upon. Um, and, I, and I think we, you know, on some level, and I brought this up before, we have to take those things into consideration until we are at the point, I guess, where people, I mean, in my opinion, I wish people were knocking on our door asking us to classify their streams as, as class A, because I, I, I think they're that important. But, you know, it, it, it's, it's about getting the resources out there to identify, maintain, and protect the habitat um, for the wild trout. But it's also a game of, of public opinion and angling support. And I think we just have to be very careful because it's going to take it all for it to happen. So, I mean, I really like the presentation. I, I, I really, you know, in some ways, I feel that, you know, a, a stream like Freeman could be a, a, a great success, but there's other factors out there that I think we have to deal with. I mean, we have a co-op that's going to lose membership or maybe they're losing membership. Um, and we, we continue to designate in a single area and I, I, I don't think it's necessary, and it doesn't even give us the time we need to make the case for why these things are great. So had we not gone to the Genesee and Baker Street next, um, maybe it wouldn't have been so much of an issue, but now that we're, we're gonna put two more on in, in, in the home waters of this co-op, um, they feel, you know, and perception's reality that, that it's gonna hurt the town, it has hurt the town, it's gonna hurt their membership, and it's gonna hurt their ability to be um, a good partner. So. You know, in some ways, there's, there's, you know, whether the motion passes or not, I, I feel it's important, but there, there's regrets because I think Freeman Run would have been a great example of what this can do. But the way we did it, I think there's, there, you know, I hope this is the last time I, me or anybody else has to ask for an exemption like this. But I, I, I think we, we boxed it in and it's, it's, it's a big state and we've got a lot of unassessed waters. And again, this is a long game, and and I and I think we have to play it that way. So we can't just look at one stream. We got to look at what's going on all around it, because we do have an angling community that that, that still wants to catch stock trout, and um, that's that's just a fact. In 2022, maybe it'll be maybe it'll be different 20 years from now. Um, we do have a co-op that that we've asked to be our partners, and yet um, I, I think in some ways maybe they're they're feeling a little bit. Um, marginalized by how we're going about the designation process. So yeah, I, I'll let it go with that. I, I like the work. I think I think this is excellent stuff. I, I and I and I wish the circumstances around this weren't what they are, but 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 they are what they are. So with that, Dan, I'll turn it back to you. Uh, thank you, Bill. Does anyone else have any questions or discussion on this topic? Dave, this this is Commissioner Kaufman. Um, Commissioner Brock mentioned and very well uh, the, the cooperative's role in this. What has been our communication with the cooperatives and and alternatives for the section that they have stocked? Yeah, yeah, good question. And and certainly, you know, communication is key. And as these waters come up for designation, that's one thing that we're very mindful of is communicating with those being impacted. Uh, in this case, cooperative nurseries. And that information happens following the class A designation. And really, you know, they, they know beforehand because they're provided the opportunity to comment on that. But we have and we will continue to work with the co-ops in identifying suitable locations. In particular to, to Freeman Run example, we provided a list of waters. Some of them were acceptable, some were not. We asked, you know, what waters would, would suit you best? They came back with a list. We say, yeah, this is, works for us. So it, it, I think it's important to remember that even from a co-op standpoint or from the fish when we're stocking, there's a process in place and what we do when, when trying to find a new home or a new stream section to stock these waters. And it's been discussed before because just because Freeman Run is, was removed from the stock trout program does not mean that the folks that are living in Potter County and surrounding counties are now losing stock trout. You know, we have, we have things in place. The first thing we wanna do is we wanna to try to establish a new stock trout water in close proximity to, to where the water that's being impacted. If one can't be found, we look for ways to increase the allocation 
um, whether it's a stocking stocking rate adjustment or whether it means adding an in-season stocking. Um, you know, all those things are taken into consideration. And really, when you look at Potter County, I mean, you really have to look that, yes, as, as Commissioner Brock mentioned, there's a significant amount of Class A waters and wild trout waters in Potter County. That's a great thing. That's a lot of recreational opportunities out there for, for folks to enjoy on a year-round basis. But there's also a substantial amount of stock trout fishery or stock trout opportunities as well. So, you know, whether you like to fish for stock trout, wild trout, or a combination of both, Potter County in itself is a destination area for, for trout enthusiasts. And we've heard about the, 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 the limited opportunities to fish for stock trout in Potter County. Uh, you guys were provided some information in your packet specific to Potter County. Potter County, when you look at the northern counties and surrounding counties, when you look at Clinton, Tioga, McKean, Cameron, Elk, Ty, or Potter County gets more stock trout than any of its surrounding counties. I mean, it, it gets a substantial amount of fish as well, on top of the wild, re, the wild trout resources that are there. Yeah, Dave, I'm, I'm not contesting that, I, I, but I would say in that one particular area with, you know, the way the co-ops work, and I think we all know it, is that, you know, they, 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 they're, they're there to enhance their home waters, right? They're there because, you know, they're, they're, they're providing fishing opportunities, not just for the people they know, but, but because of that specific small area that they, that they live in or they have their camps. So, I mean, the, you know, I don't think we're going to be successful with the co-ops if we ask them to raise fish and then take them far away from the areas that they, that they fish. Um, and I think if you look at that south, that that southwest portion where, where Austin is and where the Potter County Anglers um, really operates, it, their their options are starting to get limited. I mean, I I don't doubt all of Potter County has has the uh, the fish that you're talking about, but in that particular area, um, I don't you know, and I'm not sure how they feel about the levels of communication. Um, I, but I, I think it, I'm struggling with it a little bit. I, I wish it wasn't the case, but we have we have identified a lot of streams in a small area, and and you know I, I think we just need to learn from that. But I but I, I don't think they're how would you say it? I mean the, the stream runs through a town um, that relies on it. It runs behind you know the high school. Um, they're they're not seeing the value right now of all of these Class A streams. I think they they understand it. But it's, you know, some of the information, I'm a commissioner, I've been a commissioner for four years, this is my district, and some of this information today was, was new about the stream enhancements and, you know, some of these other things you guys are talking about doing, and I'm, I'm glad to hear it, but I, I it, you know, I, I think we've passed that point. I, I think that locally, they're concerned. Okay, uh, this is Eric Hussar. Um, you know, I, I, you know, we're at the point as we were the, the commission 40 years ago. Um, and it's fast forward now from Operation Future, which was a policy that came out in, the, in, in 1981 about, uh, you know, just to sum it up about uh, managing our self-sustaining fish populations as a renewable resource, in addition to using hatchery fish where the, um, um, from a recreational standpoint in waters where fish populations can't be sustained um, or inadequate for the, you know, to sustain uh, wild trout. But uh, um, we do have history where this has worked and, and it wasn't so long ago, um, um, Section 3 Pence Creek um, in 1992, um, we stopped stocking that stream. And we know the results there. It's one of the best on the East Coast. Section five, we did a few years ago, um, the co-op nursery and, and the fish that we used to stock there from the commission were created a new section, section six, providing anglers opportunity to fish there also. And in section five, um, based on our surveys, continues to improve from, this, from the wild trout aspect. And, uh, um, you know, again, we, we're discussing it now, the commission. Um, 
the future of these wild trout assets, the protection of them, the management of them, the conservation of them. And, you know, we, we keep coming to this crossroad of, of what we do, how we do it. Um, I got to think, Dave, and this sort of goes back, you know, Bill, you mentioned it. You, we're putting, we were stocking these sections for years. Um, I got to think some of the wild trout moved out of there um, um, as the pressure, you know, from angular pressure in those sections um, to other areas. And uh, with that, we'll never know the full potential of that, 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 that those stream sections, you know, with any kind of stocking over them with, with wild trout. And that goes in, I guess that goes with all these class A's. We will never know the full potential of these streams and the maximum level of, of carrying wild trout if we continue to, you know, have the angler pressures on. The, the anglers are going to come, they're going to take stock trout, they're going to take wild trout. And um, um, we all know the economic value, you know, our hatchery costs can continue to go up. You know, the economic portion of that is a whole nother issue, but, uh, um, and we should champion it. And we, we both said it. Um, I mean, these are, we do have some remarkable wild trout fisheries in Pennsylvania. And, uh, um, uh, you know, it, it just, we're at this discussion again and the status quo and, 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 you know, I look at section three on Penn's Creek from 1992 to now. Yeah, that had a big impact down there in 1992. Everybody came there. It was a stock trout fishery. And uh, uh, now you look at the, the fishing avidity there now and the number of people that come there and the destination sp um, um, spot it's created, not only in Pennsylvania, but all over the country, um, people come to Penn's Creek because of the fishery. So um, 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 there's a lot of opportunity there for us with this. And, uh, you know, commissioners, I just hope we all um, consider that with uh, what we're going to do going forward. And this is, uh, we've been talking this for a couple of years now. I've been on the board seven years. It's still a, it's still a topic. And, uh, um, and you know, I just think the, the, the potential and the opportunity um, to create both fisheries, stock trout fisheries, and then our wild trout aspect of it is, um, is really the golden ring we need to we, we need to strive for, and uh, um, um, and the opportunities there, and it's for everybody in the Commonwealth. So um, um, I just wanted to add that comment there. But those fish, I, and I, I guess I revert back quick. Those fish, you know, I would suspect those wild trout move with angling pressure, and I, I don't know. If, uh, you mentioned the negative impact on stocking that. I got to think the wild trout are moving out of these those stream sections as the pressure increases. I know we don't have the science on it. We don't have the data on that. Um, but I would I would think that would be the case on some of those sections on stream and run. Yeah, I, my only comment is I, I don't disagree with any of that, I mean, my point is, if we can't bend, we're still learning how to do this and and and, and get it all right. And it's a big, big job. You know, I, if circumstances were different, I would say don't touch it, but they aren't. And I think if we can't bend a little bit, remembering this is a long, long game and that we've got to bring people around and we've got to show them the value of these streams. But if, if we can't bend, we may not get there. Well, Bill, where, where are we? Where aren't we going to get to? We're we're we're, we're protecting the resource, a self-sustaining resource that could even get better. We'll never know that, and and let alone all the external factors that are affecting these wild trout streams right now. These are the most fragile. They're, they're the most impactful streams we have in this Commonwealth. I mean, they're, the pressure on these streams is not going up away. You know, it's. We could go on with a million less climate change, the, the urban sprawl, and uh, um, you know we're 
when is it going to end? We keep bending. We keep bending. We, we've been bending for 40 years since Operation Future came in. And, uh, um, uh, you know, we could get both. And um, um, we could have both. We could have some of the best. We do have some of the best wild trout fisheries on the East Coast. Um, you know, strategic plan wise, we, we even made a con I think even in our strategic plan that we did a few years ago, we wanted to be a leader in the country on this. Um, this isn't be a leader. Status quo is not be a leader. This is Commissioner Pathbury. Can I just give an example, kind of a dramatic example? And and I I'm still evaluating where what I think the answer is, but Let's just take this example. So let's say we we go into Potter County and we survey every stream that's out there and all of them turn out to meet the criteria for class A, every one of them. And all of them have a few brook trout in them also. And we have two co-ops right in the middle of the county that have been stocking for decades. So now none of them are gonna meet the exemption requirements because there's some brook trout in there and we're basically going to tell these co-ops okay you can take your fish and move them to some other county and we also you know we've just recognized that there are people who are really used to fishing for trout fishing for stock trout that's what they like to do that's what they've done they have a tradition of doing it they and so we're just going to stop stocking trout in the entire county and tell those co-ops, take your fish and move them to another county. I just, I guess my concern is that could be the logical sort of outcome. And have we, have we thought through what the consequence of that is? And I think I can see where Bill's going with that. Like we're, you're going to, you may end up changing the characteristic of the anglers who come. The, the people who used to fish it were local people who fish for stock trout. And yes, there's even more anglers, but now they're out of town anglers who are coming and the local anglers are upset because you changed the dynamic of the fishery. And so is it good or bad economically? Um, I don't know. It's, 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 but what it probably is, is disruptive in the short term. So I, I, I don't know what the answer is, but I, I guess I could see where this could play out where I'm not sure what I can see how the logical consequence of this could really cause some anxiety to, to the local residents. Dan, Dan, this, yeah, is, Dan, this is Eric Hussar. That played out on Penn's Creek already. Through the through through the history of that, uh, the, a, a couple of different sections on Penn's Creek that played out on over the last probably thirty years. So, um, in the end result, we have a, we have a, we have a tremendous fishery there. I'm just giving you the data from down below there. Yes, and and Commissioner Hussar and and Commissioner Pastore, this is Chris Coon. Just to I, you know, I understand, you know, the scenario that Dan described and, 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 and certainly can appreciate those concerns and, you know, to help alleviate those concerns, perhaps, uh, you know, in the case of, in the case of Freeman run, certainly, as Dave mentioned, one of the first and foremost things we, we, we do before designating a stock trout water class A and removing it from the stocking list is to identify new waters uh, to, uh, reallocate those fish to to in the case of Freeman Run that was done uh, in in proximity to Freeman Run so within four to sixteen miles from from Freeman Run is is where the Fish and Boat Commission allocations went and as Dave mentioned we certainly take take a lot of effort and and, and attempt to work with cooperative nurseries to come up with streams for them to stock as well and and certainly work with them in that regard. I guess what happens is uh, if this is Commissioner Lewis, <clears throat> uh, Chairman Pastore, if I might have a comment. 
Sure. Okay. Um, I would like to say that I've listened carefully to all of this discussion and I like Bill Brock recognized the importance of wild trout fisheries in class A waters. For the last four years, I've sat in a committee meetings and excuse me, in quarterly meetings and approved dozens, if not hundreds, of these designations. Um, and I think that it's it's uh, not I'm actually surprised that we only have this kind of maybe there's more, but only this one instance of local people. Uh, who fished that stream previously that when it was stocked um, or a section of it, uh, being a little concerned and, and not being terribly happy about the cessation of stocking. Um, I'm a person who uh, thinks that the commission needs to do two things. It needs to, to protect the resource, uh, both the fisheries and the aquatic portion of the resource, uh, in this case, wild trout, and it also needs to meet the the wants and the needs of its anglers. And um, I personally, um, if, if I had received feedback from, strong feedback from a lot of anglers saying that this was really not the best option for them there, um, I would probably um, probably lean toward the side of, of, uh, of trying to meet their needs in this one specific instance because it's only one specific instance. I don't think it opens the door for hundreds of more of these incidences. And I would also like to say that um, <clears throat> I would think that about 95% of the time the commissioners have voted to support staff recommendations on wild trout and other things. But conceivably, there's gonna be a time when because of the angler pressure or because of trying to serve our anglers, we may wanna take a different path and I want to say that if that is the case, um, it doesn't mean that we disrespect or we don't respect everything that the staff does. We don't consider any kind of an insult. We just consider it that we we're responding to angler need on one very small piece of water. I think I remember correctly that we now have 2,800 2, miles of Class A water. And if we're talking about taking a half a mile of this or a couple of miles of it, and changing it back to a previous designation, I don't think that impacts what we're trying to do uh, for wild trout as a whole. So I uh, thank you for allowing me to make this comment. Thank you. This is Commissioner Charles Worth. Uh, the questions for David. Overall, what's the general outcome? Let me rephrase that. What is the most important reason for having Class A designation? Well, certainly there, there's multiple, you know, benefits to having a Class A designation, but, you know, the one is just the added level of protection that is provided or applied to that stream section that, you know, benefits uh, the resource itself. Would I be wrong in saying that the protection of the resource is one of the biggest reasons for having Class A, correct? Yeah, and the, the, obviously the, the protection can encompass multiple things, whether, you know, it's permitting activities that can occur in a Class A, discharges, you know, protection to wetlands, you know, even just the restriction of any type of stocking that can occur. So all those things could be considered uh, protection to the resource. How much does a wild trout stream cost us? Well, I mean, I guess I don't have an exact answer to, you know, you can, to put a, put a number on it, but certainly when you look at some of the programs that our agency has, monitoring wild trout populations is significantly less expensive than, you know, our stock trout program. That's correct. Um, you know, I sometimes look at things as budgetary requirements and I mean my opinion is someone mentioned I think it was Richard that what if all the streams 
became class C. And I think we're missing the point. If they all became class A, there's plenty of places, plenty of things, plenty of opportunities to fish. If, you know, the stock fish, if, if there was no need for them, then it'd be great. We'd have all that natural resource available to the people. Nobody's saying that they can't fish. They're just saying that it's a wild trout stream and it needs protection. I remember when I was the president of Trout Unlimited and the Fish Commission came to us and said, look, we would like to make 10 sections that is class A, but we stock over it. And there was an agreement. That's all we'll ever ask for is 10. These 10 we feel, real, we feel really important. And then a couple of years later, I said, oh, well, we want to do 15, but that's all we're going to do. And if, if it just keeps going on, um, you're defeating the purpose of a Class A stream. That's my two cents. Dan, Thank you. Dan, does this, anyone else have yeah, any Dan, comments? Dan, this is Eric Hussar again. Uh, you know, again, we're talking about bending and moving and not enough time or too much time and, uh, you know, one of the one of the realities of this whole thing, uh, you know, we're talking about stock waters and wild trout waters. I mean, we have more waters to stock than trout to stock them with in Pennsylvania. I mean, that's a reality, and we're blessed with that. So, uh, um, I mean, that's something to consider here. Um, um, you know. It, it, we talked about this last year, you know, when um, um, I was proposing to regulate class A wild trout streams, which wasn't adopted by the board. Um, currently, they're under the five creel limit. Um, um, you know, again, it's it's. Where are we going with all this? And are we are we ever going to are we going to continue to bend and move uh, away from tackling some of these tough issues? Uh, um, that that's really going to undermine and continue to you know we're you know fast forward forty years from now they may be having these same conversations and at that point we may not be in an opportunity to um, through our waterways. Uh, sustain the fisheries that we do have now. So we would miss out on an opportunity that they can't catch up on. But um, no, I appreciate the discussion. And uh, um, um, again, we have a lot of water in Pennsylvania. We have a lot of places to put these fish. It creates upper opportunities. It's a better use of our, our, our hatchery trout um, in these waters that can, can't sustain um, Wild trout for whatever reason. So, um, you know, let's just, you know, I, I, I hope we could come together on this stuff and, uh, um, the, the, especially the board we have now to, um, um, create a path going forward that's going to, um, benefit both, um, both aspects of, uh, our, our, our fisheries. Thanks. Yeah, and, and, and Commissioner Hassar, this is Chris Kuhn again. Just to your point, I just wanted to mention that the, the, the vast majority of the stock trout waters that we have in Pennsylvania are, are in class C, D, and E. In other words, the lowest or no, well, lowest biomass waters or um, no biomass waters. And the, the one of the primary intents of the uh, stock trout, adult stock trout program is to provide recreational angling opportunities for trout where they otherwise would not exist. Uh, one last comment. I mean, I, I agree with that, Chris. I mean, I, I think my point is that I think we can learn something from what, from, from the way all these things were handled, the designation, the areas, how we chose, 
Um, and as we move forward, we'll do we'll do a better job. But I I I, I am still concerned about this section of Potter County. These are these are where people these are where people live or have camps where they you know they fish there for generations. Um, I think we're going to win this, but we're not going to we're not going to win it if we if we don't have the ability to speak. Again, part of this. To get to where we want to be, we have to have the angling community behind us. We have to be able to demonstrate the value of class A. And, you know, I've talked with Tim and I know we're trying to do everything we can. We're learning. We're getting there. We're getting better. You know, my hope is that a situation like this won't have to come up again. We just have to be, we just have to learn as we go. And that it's, it, it's not just a scientific process. It's a process that involves people, communications, public relations, all these other things. If we don't have that, and if people can't see the value and we're not working to show them the value, I think that's going to be the biggest obstacle to get into that vision that we have 20, 30 years down the line. Because I don't think any, I don't think any of us have a, I don't think any of us argue that that's the right vision. You know, I, I see this whole discussion as to how do we get there. And again, for me, it's a long game. And, and, you know, we're just going to have to make a few concessions along the way. And Richard, just to, to the comment you made, um, I, we're not talking about declassifying it. We, we were, you know, the motion I would like to put out there is for an exemption to allow them to stop. Thanks, Dan. Thank you. So why don't we wrap this up and take a short break? We have one more uh, presentation item, and then I think uh, Commissioner Brock has a motion. So why don't we take a short break and then we can take those final matters up. So uh, why don't we resume at 255? So it's 255. Let's resume the meeting. It's my understanding, Commissioner Brock has a motion he would like to make uh, attorney melnick do you have a transcript of that or do we have written okay great thank you uh commissioner brock do you want to proceed i do um wayne do you want to read it to make sure we get it right Certainly, Commissioner. So the the motion that uh, is being made is that uh, Commissioner Brock moves that the committee recommend to the full board to exempt Freeman Run from the Commission's statement policy at 58 PA Code Section 57.8A and allow Potter County Anglers and the Pennsylvania Fish and Boat Commission to resume stocking of Freeman Run from the campground located north of Austin Pennsylvania upstream from the Austin Dam, downstream to the mouth at the confluence of Freeman Run and the First Fork Cinnamon Creek beginning in 2022. Uh, Commissioner Brock, will you make that motion? Yes, I will make that motion. So do I do we have a second? Sorry, sorry. Yes, do we have a second for this motion? Uh, Commissioner Brock, I, I'd be more inclined to move this forward if there was some. Well, if there's not a second, you can't. I mean, this, all the second does is allow us to vote on it. So, yeah. but your prerogative. Well, I was just gonna say that Without a time limit, um, it seems to be indefinite. So, I mean, if I have no second, then um, the motion fails. Do you have any other comment you want to make on this? No, I had my say. I appreciate that. Okay, thank you. I think we have one last agenda item then if we can move on to that. Thank you, Commissioner Pastori. Can you guys uh, back and, and see the presentation? Yes, looks good. Thank you. Okay. 
All right, thank you, Commissioner Pistori. Um, so the last topic on today's agenda is just an overview of the fisheries agenda items um, that are planned for the January 2022 quarterly commission meeting. Uh, so there'll be two proposed designations, an amendment um, to the miscellaneous special regulations that apply uh, to Penns Creek Section 3, also miscellaneous special regulations amendment um, on Little Chartier's Creek Section 5 in Washington County. There'll be two designations. Um, there'll be a proposed changes to the list of Class A wild trout streams, and the last designation will be the classification of wild trout streams, proposed additions, and one revision to the list. There's also in other matters, which is the ratification of temporary changes to fishing regulations specific to Raccoon Creek State Park, um, which is located in, in Beaver County. So the first proposed rulemaking um, is to remove Penns Creek Section 3, which is located in center in Mifflin County, uh, Mifflin Counties, uh, from the miscellaneous special regulations. At the January 2022 quarterly commission meeting, staff plan to recommend the commission approve the publication of a notice of proposed rulemaking containing the amendment. Uh, the amendment will ask that we propose to remove, as I mentioned before, section three of Penns Creek from the miscellaneous special regulations. If these regulations are removed, section three will be proposed for designation into the all tackle trout slot limit program at either the July or October commission meeting. If approved, the name of the regulation applied to Penn Street Section 3 will change. However, the regulation itself would remain the same. This would allow for a seamless transition and management strategies applied to the stream section. One thing that I, I want to mention just to make it clear is that um, Penn Street Section 3, as part of this seamless transition um, from a miscellaneous special regulation to the proposed slot limit regulation, at no point will either one of these with current regulation lapse, meaning that at no point will be managed under Commonwealth uh, inland regulations. It'll be a seamless transition if approved by the board from miscellaneous special regs into the slot limit program. If adopted on final rulemaking, this amendment will go into effect on January 1st of 2023. The next proposed rulemaking uh, is gonna be the amendment to Little Chartier's Creek. It's miscellaneous special regulations that apply to it. Uh, specifically removing Little Chartier's Creek from the Miscellaneous Special Regulations Program. So at the January 2022 quarterly commission meeting, staff plan to re recommend the commission approve the publication of a notice of proposed rulemaking containing the, the amendment. If the regulations, miscellaneous special regulations are removed from Little Chartier's Creek Section 5, it will be managed under Commonwealth Inland Waters, Commonwealth Inland Waters Angling Regulations. This too, if adopted on final rulemaking, will go into effect on January 1st of 2023. Next, the designations. The first designations will be proposed changes to the list of Class A wild trout streams. The list of Class A streams was put up on the Pennsylvania Bulletin on November 20th for public comment. Uh, the commissioners will be provided a summary of all the public comments that were received uh, in regard to this proposed designation at the commission meeting. So again, at the, at the upcoming commission meeting, staff plan to recommend the commission add eight stream sections to its list of Class A wild trout streams. If approved, these designations will go into effect upon publication of a second notice in the Pennsylvania Bulletin. The last designation we have is, is the classification of wild trout streams, the proposed additions in one revision to the list of, of wild trout streams. This, Proposed designations were also published in the PA Bulletin on November 20th of 2021, and identical to the Class A comments, the wild trout comments will be provided to the commissioners in advance of the quarterly commission meeting. At the upcoming January 2022 quarterly commission meeting, staff will recommend the commission add nine new waters to the commission's list of wild trout streams and revise the section limits to one water currently listed. If approved, these designations will go into effect upon publication of a second notice in the PA Bulletin. The last topic that will be discussed will be in the other matters, uh, specific to the ratification of temporary changes to fishing regulations for Raccoon Creek State Park, Upper Pond, also known as Group Camping, area, group camping Lake Area, located in Beaver County. And this one probably is familiar uh, because the same process was, was taken in July of 2021. That process was the, the executive director has taken action to modify temporary fishing regulations at Raccoon, Raccoon Creek State Park Upper Pond in anticipation for a complete and permanent drawdown of the lake. 
This is an extension of the previous action that was taken for the same purpose in July, on July 17th of 2021. Um, that action was, was scheduled to expire of, of, on January 1st of this year. So for that reason, um, we have to propose another change in temporary regulations. A notice of the temporary change was published in the PA Bulletin on December 25th. Um, the action lifted all season size and curl limits for all species effective the first of this year and will remain in effect until further notice. And that is the last slide of my presentations, Commissioner Pastori. Thank you. The streams that are coming up for designation as class A, are any of those in the vicinity of Freeman Run? Uh, that, that's a good question. I don't uh, have a list in front of me, but I do know that none of these Class A streams are stocked by a cooperative nursery or the commission. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Does anyone else have any other new business to bring before the committee? Uh, hearing none, uh, Attorney Melnick, if you can announce the time and place of the next meeting. The, the next meeting will be January 24th. Uh, the public portion will begin at 10 a.m. Uh, the plan is to have another virtual uh, meeting. Uh, notice will go out on our website and in the usual sources. Uh, expect the, the notice to be available on the w website uh, by, this, by this afternoon with the uh, specific details. Thank you. Thank you. thank you, Attorney Melnick. Well, thank you everyone for participating today. It was a great discussion that will conclude today's meeting. And I, with that, I will adjourn the meeting at 3.05. Thank you.